the speaker today who wrote this book, The Wonders of Creation, and I just can't stop looking at this gorgeous photograph. She's also a superb photographer. Um, she had to do her lectures in the Hansen series on Zoom because it was COVID. And so we wanted to bring a live audience to appreciate the importance of what she has done. And I am so glad that you are here tonight. And I am introducing now to you uh, Marjorie Mead, who is the Associate Director of the Wade Center. And I realize you don't know who I am. I am Dr. Crystal Downing. I am the co-director of the Wade Center, along with my husband, David Downing. And what's fun for us is this topic of relating environmental studies to Wade authors was one of the first decisions that David and I were able to make when we started our job in 2018. And I still remember that moment when I met with Walter Hansen, who created the funding for this series in honor of his parents, Ken and Jean Hansen. And I hadn't, he's on the Wade board, I had never met him before. And <clears throat> We were sitting around discussing what should be the topic of our next Hansen lecture series. And I just said, you know, I have a real passion for the environment. Can we do something that relates concerns of the environment to our authors? And I saw Marjorie Mead, our associate director, her eyes just lit up and she said, I have the perfect person. <laughs> so I'm going to have her introduce that perfect person to you now. Thank you, Crystal. Um, it's a true joy to have all of you here tonight. And we are going to, by the way, try to um, create a recording of this using phones and other things. So if you know someone who misses it, Hopefully it will be able to be posted on our website, but give, give us a little time because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bit of a work. Um, anyway, it is a true joy to be able to introduce Dr. Kristen Page this evening. As professor of biology at Wheaton College, Dr. Page holds the Ruth Kraft Strohschein Distinguished Chair. Dr. Page um, is a gifted speaker, and it's just a joy to be able to hear from her in person tonight. As Crystal mentioned, the challenges we'd had with COVID. Um, she'll be speaking tonight on the fictional landscapes of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis as a means of helping <coughs> us to develop a greater real life appreciation for God's created world. Dr. Page is uniquely qualified to speak to this subject, not only as a highly regarded scientist, but also as a great reader of literature who understands firsthand the power of story to touch our hearts and inform our minds. Known for both the quality of her teaching as well as the excellence and results of her research work, Dr. Page received her PhD from <coughs> Purdue University in Forestry and Natural Resources. She was honored in 2020 by Purdue with their Distinguished Agriculture Alumni Award. In 2021, she was awarded the Senior Service Award from Wheaton College, having already received two earlier teaching awards for her academic contributions here. In terms of her scholarly work, Dr. Page has expertise in wildlife diseases, particularly how the transmission of disease changes when landscapes are altered by human resource use. An area of special interest in her research is her focus on the raccoon round, roundworm, how it's transmitted, and how its presence can be decreased in public areas, such as forest preserves and green spaces. Dr. Page has published numerous articles on her area of interest and is frequently asked to consult with wildlife officials on the development and use of mitigation strategies 
in order to protect public health with a special emphasis on protecting children. A dedicated teacher, Dr. Page is quick to say how much she loves working with her research students, averaging nine to 10 that she works with each year. She is also generous with her time given to mentoring and visiting Wheaton College hunger students. And she's visited over 20 students in 15 countries during her time here at Wheaton. In her travel, she has the opportunity to enjoy some really incredible things, um, some of which she'll be sharing with us tonight through her photographs, spending time with the gorillas in Uganda, studying in the Galapagos as an undergrad, even visiting Ye Yellowstone National Park about 25 times. Those are just a few of her adventures. Um, having, you can find out more during the Q&A of time tonight. Um, Anyway, will you please join me in welcoming our friend and colleague, Dr. Kristen Page, as she speaks to us on her new book, The Wonders of Food. Wow, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, it's amazing to see you all here. Maybe it surprises you to see me a disease ecologist and an ecology professor standing before you to talk about J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. It surprises me too. <laughs> I was so honored to be asked to give the Hansen Lectures in 2020 and 2021, and I was really terrified. I had no idea where to start. So I decided that I would start by exploring the landscapes created by J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis in their fiction, as an ecologist would. So as I walked through their fictional landscapes, I realized that I was experiencing them very much like I experienced real landscapes or actual landscapes. I discovered that I have the same emotions and the same reactions to the things I'm reading as the things that I'm seeing in these landscapes. And I realized that if that works for me, then the people who never go into physical landscapes that only spend their time in fictional landscapes might also have a similar reaction. And I thought this might just be the best place to start. So tonight, I want to take you through some of my favorite landscapes so I can help you understand how being in these places has helped to cultivate a land ethic in me or a posture towards stewardship of the places that God has created and that I love. Is there a place where you feel really close to God and the most at peace? I'm talking about that shalom peace, that peace that's found in God. If you're like me, I'm sorry, Father Kevin, I might feel closer to God outside than in a church. <laughs> now, I really love worshiping with my community of believers, but I do feel closer to God when I'm outside. Specifically, I experience shalom when I'm in forests. I love to walk through forests, feeling the leaves and the acorns crunching under my feet and smelling the rich soil and the moldy leaves, hearing the chorus of chickadee dee dee, woodpeckers drumming, squirrels chirruping, seeing hundreds of shades of green and yellow as the light filters through the canopy. I've always loved this dappled light. And I think C.S. Lewis coined it perfectly. He calls it God light. What amazing imagery. And it makes so much sense to me because I feel God's presence so strongly when I'm in the forest. So this is the beginning of my land ethic or my desire to be a steward of creation. Well, as often as I'm in real forests, I also spend a lot of time in imaginary forests and one of my favorite places is the land between worlds and C.S. Lewis is the magician's nephew. Let's go there now. All the light was green light that came through the leaves, but there must have been a very strong sun overhead for this green daylight was bright and warm. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. There were no birds, no insects, no animals and no wind. You could almost feel the trees growing. The pool he had just got out of was not the only pool. There were dozens of others, a pool every few yards as far as his eyes could reach. 
You could almost feel the trees drinking the water up with their roots. This wood was very much alive. When he tried to describe it afterward, Diggory always said it was a rich place, as rich as plum cake. The strangest thing was that almost before he had looked about him, Diggory had half forgotten how he had come there. If anyone had asked him, where did you come from? He would have probably said, I've always been here. That was what it felt like, as if one had always been in that place and never been bored, although nothing had ever happened. As he said long afterward, it's not the sort of place where things happen. The trees go on growing. That's all. Were you able to enter this forest with me? As I read, what did you imagine? For me, I could picture the greenness. I'm also really struck by how quiet it was and the way that he describes the feeling of trees growing. I love that when I'm in this landscape, I can slow myself enough to possibly feel a tree grow. This place between worlds to me feels like what the psalmist suggests to those of us reading Psalm 46:10. Be still and know that I am God. In the place between worlds, Lewis has created a landscape that seems so real that I am motivated to change. These places make me want to do something to protect actual places in the world that evoke the same desire to be still. C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien were able to create fictional landscapes that feel so real because they both spent a lot of time exploring real landscapes. These authors both had a lot of knowledge about the natural world. As a boy, Tolkien's mother taught him botany and instilled in him a lifelong love of trees. In fact, Tolkien explains in a letter to the editor of the Daily Telegraph that in all his works, he takes the part of trees against all their enemies. Lewis originally learned about the beauty of nature when his brother brought a biscuit tin garden into the nursery. And both Tolkien and Lewis loved exploring landscapes as they walked. The time, um, and often they walked together. So this time that they spent in nature allowed them to create fictional landscapes that are believable and that we can care about. When we as readers spend time in these landscapes, we can begin our transformation and become stewards of creation. When we spend time in a place, real or imagined, we begin to know the place. When I teach, I create assignments that help students know more about the created world. Some of the assignments take them out into actual landscapes. I require them to spend time sitting in nature and get, being quiet and getting to know a place. I call this assignment reading landscapes. And I love so much the insights that my students develop as they actually take time away from busyness and get to know a place well. One student actually described the process as befriending a place. I love that idea. My desire for students to know more about ecosystems was actually the first way I began using the literature of Tolkien in the classroom. In an attempt to help students learn to describe ecosystems, I gave them a passage from Lord of the Rings and asked them to describe the structure and function of each relationship that they read about. Let me give you an example. I'm going to use Legolas's description of Lothlorien. There lie the woods of Lothlorien. That is the fairest of all the dwellings of my people. There are no trees like the trees of that land. For in the autumn, their leaves fall not, but turn to gold. Not till the spring comes and the new green opens do they fall. And then the boughs are laden with yellow flowers, and the floor of the wood is golden, and golden is the roof, and its pillars are silver, for the bark of the tree is smooth and gray. My heart would be glad if I were beneath the eaves of that wood. Now, Tolkien isn't teaching us ecology, but we can learn that mallorn trees are tardily deciduous. They hold their leaves through winter. And when the leaves fall as new leaves emerge, they add nutrients to the forest floor just at the right time when temperatures are warming and can expedite the process of decomposition and nutrient cycling. 
We can also understand that this is a mature forest from the pillars of the trees. And these mature forests have healthy relationships between all of the organisms that are living there. Reading this section ecologically might even give us some insight into what Tolkien is doing. When the Fellowship leaves Lothlorien, they are restored. And there is some science to support the idea that time spent in mature forests is restorative for our health. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Knowing is an important first step in our transformation as stewards. God created places so that he could be in relationship with us as we enjoy what he has created. Knowing about creation leads to respect, which might motivate us to care about the places and creatures God has created. Ultimately, knowing and respecting creation should lead us to love, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, as we read in Matthew. I believe that loving our neighbors requires us to understand a few things about creation. First, we need to understand that we are created. If we don't see ourselves as part of creation, we've already established a layer of separation that can prevent us from seeing injustices against creation and against our neighbors. Privilege is a dangerous symptom of failing to recognize our creatureliness. When our ideologies or theologies keep us separate from creation, we are more likely to maintain a lifestyle that is not only damaging to creation, but one that allows us to keep ourselves separate from this damage and separate from the harm to our neighbors. Bill McKibben, a famous environmentalist, calls the impact of lifestyles driven by consumerism the orthodoxy of more. Those of us who are in pursuit of more typically the privileged world, often don't recognize the problems that result from our lifestyle. We benefit from a globalized economy. We can, we can purchase specialty, specialty items from anywhere in the world at any time, have it delivered directly to our doorstep overnight. These patterns of consumerism not only perpetuate the myth that we're separate from creation, but they keep us separate from our neighbors. And the impacts of our consumerism are hidden from us from zone, by zoning or environmental laws that were created to protect the wealthy neighborhoods in wealthy countries. Climate change, sorry, I forgot to click. Here we are. Climate change <coughs> is ultimately the long-term consequence of our privileged consumption. Cynthia Molobita writes that climate change might be the most far-reaching manifestation of white privilege and class privilege to face humankind. It's caused overwhelmingly by high consuming people and climate change is wreaking death and destruction foremost on impoverished people who are disproportionately people of color. So when we're like Edmund in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and we're always wanting more Turkish delight and we're continuing to pursue this satisfaction through consumption, we are perpetuating what Rob Nixon calls a slow violence against our neighbors. In this way, privilege hides truth. And if it's hidden for too long, we might be too late to react. And I have a couple of examples of this from the fiction of Lewis and Tolkien. Remember King Tyrion in The Last Battle? So he's at his hunting lodge, living simply and sitting under a great oak, enjoying the pleasant spring weather away from the state and pomp of Care Paravel. And he starts receiving messages of Aslan's return to Narnia from the birds and the squirrels. Just as Tyrion is questioning the rumors of the return of Aslan to Narnia, a dryad of a beech tree comes to him with an urgent message about deforestation and the felling of great trees. By the time Tyrion hears the message and then responds, it's too late for many of the ancient trees. Right through the middle of that ancient forest, that forest where the trees of gold and of silver had once grown, a broad lane had already been opened. It was a hideous lane, like a raw gash in the land, full of muddy ruts 
where felled trees had been dragged down to the river. In the scouring of the Shire, Tolkien also gives us an example of privileged characters discovering the impacts of their consumerism. When the hobbits return to the Shire after their travels with the fellowship, they are shocked to see the state of their beloved home. It was one of the saddest hours in their lives. The great chimney rose up before them, and as they drew near the old village across the water, through rows of new mean houses along each side of the road, they saw the new mill in all its frowning and dirty ugliness, a great brick building straddling the stream which it fouled with steaming and stinking overflow. All along the Bywater Road, every tree had been felled. As they crossed the bridge and looked up the hill, they gasped. Even Sam's vision of, in the mirror had not prepared him for what they saw. The old grange on the west side had been knocked down and in its place taken by rows of tarred sheds. All the chestnuts were gone. The banks and hedgerows were broken. Great wagons were standing in disorder in a field beaten bare of grass. Bagshot Row was a yawning sand and gravel quarry. Bag End, up beyond, could not be seen for a clutter of large huts. They've cut it down, cried Sam. They've cut down the party tree. He pointed to where the tree had stood, under which Bilbo had made his farewell speech. It was lying lopped and dead in the field. As if this was the last straw, Sam burst into tears. For those of you who know this story well, you recognize that the transformation of the Shire actually began before the fellowship departed on their journey. The extravagant party under that tree given by Bilbo where everyone received and expected a gift suggests that the consumption was a norm. It took time away by the, by the hobbits from what they knew to be familiar, both place and habit to recognize the impact of the orthodoxy of Moore on the other hobbits and the Shire. So how do we respond? How do we acknowledge our privilege and love our neighbor? We're called to lament. Soon Chung Ra explains that lament is a way for us to understand struggle, to call out for justice, and a means for us to challenge privilege. Lament is not complaining, rather it's a true expression of sadness and an acknowledgement of the suffering of our neighbors before God. As such, lament brings change, or what Tolkien refers to as recovery. Recovery achieved through story helps us regain a clearer or corrected view of the realities of the world. Lament moves us to action. Our first action might just be to acknowledge a need for change and a distancing from the orthodoxy of more. Tolkien and Lewis both give us examples of characters moved to action and transformed by time spent in these landscapes of Middle Earth and Narnia. Tolkien especially uses trees and forests to transform his characters. When the hobbits entered the old forest, they're looking for a quick way across the landscape the forest is a means to an end. After Old Man Willow teaches them a lesson, we read that they began to understand the lives of the forest apart from themselves. Indeed, to feel themselves as the strangers where all other things were at home. Perhaps we too can experience a transformation of understanding of ourselves as part of creation when we spend time in these landscapes. When we begin to change our understanding of self as created, knowing that we're created, we might even begin to challenge privilege as lament requires. While many of us immediately think of sadness when we speak of lament, and certainly that is a very important part of it, we should also consider wonder as an important part of transformation and action. Wonder is described by Lani Shiota as that moment when our minds are trying to stretch, to take in and comprehend whatever it is that's before us. Stephen Bauma Prediger suggests that wonder is a virtue in which we stand in rapt attention and amazement in the presence of something awe-inspiring, mysterious, or novel. 
fiction can help us cultivate this virtue. Consider Aslan's song and the magician's nephew. As we hear the wild tune and begin to see moles, frogs, elephants, and even lampposts, we contemplate the cacophony of beginnings and something stirs in us. If you're like me, you feel moved, a sort of reverence when you hear this song. Or as Lewis explains, the song might make you want to run and jump and climb or even shout. Balma Prediger explains that the virtue of wonder helps us recognize an amazement for God's creation that will result in gratitude and desire to steward creation. As such, wonder seems to be important in achieving these transformed lives. <coughs> when we spend time in fictional landscapes as readers, I believe that we experience wonder in ways that can change us and our interactions with the actual landscapes. For me, I move to action when I hear Aslan's song. For the moment, I am in Narnia, and I respond to Aslan's request to be. Narnia, 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 awake, love, think, speak, be walking trees, be talking beasts, be divine waters. Lewis gives us another important example of transformation and wonder in the voyage of the Dawn Treader. Remember Eustace? I think he could help us see more clearly how we're blinded by the orthodoxy of more and our need for transformation. His life of privilege certainly blinded him to how he impacted his neighbors, but a wonderful encounter with a dragon seemed to change everything. It would certainly be wonderful enough just to see a dragon, but Eustace actually became a dragon. <laughs> we read about his transformation here. He, he realized that he was a monster cut off from the whole human race. An appalling loneliness came over him. He began to see that the others had not really been fiends at all. He began to wonder if he himself had been such a nice person as he had always supposed. And then after Aslan restores him, we read, it would be nice and fairly true to say that from that time forth, Eustace was a different boy. To be strictly accurate, he began to be a different boy. He had relapses. There were still many days when he could be very tiresome, but most of these I shall not notice. The cure had begun. Spending as much time exploring nature is important to cultivate wonder. My family loves to camp and hike and stargaze. But even when we aren't on a camping trip, I find ways to explore. One of my favorite ways to explore is to wander along trails on them or off of them with my camera, stopping to investigate anything and maybe everything that catches my eye. And since writing my original lectures, I've also begun exploring the sounds of creation. In fact, most weekends, I now head out to a local forest preserve with my microphones to see what I can capture. Exploring this new symphony has provided a new avenue of wonder, and we're gonna hope that you can hear some of this now. So listen to some of my favorite discoveries, hopefully. I think you have to click on it. That wasn't it. <laughs> and if we can't hear it, I'll just tell you about it. I don't know if you all can hear it. I'm sorry. So I wonder what you're hearing. Certainly you're hearing an airplane. And I was really close to the interstate. So you're hearing the interstate. But 
You were also hearing a squirrel chewing on a nut right in front of the microphone. <laughs> and you were hearing chickadees and nut hatches and titmice and flickers and all kinds of things. And I was recording for over a half hour and the squirrel chewed the nut the entire time. <laughs> and when I was approaching, I wasn't at my microphone when that plane flew over and it caused them to just go crazy. And I got out of the car to walk towards the microphone and it just got louder and louder as the plane went over. So I can't wait to learn more about what's happening with the sounds, but all of this is my desire to try to cultivate wonder in my, in my life. So how did the sounds make you feel? So you should know that when I'm out doing this, I always take my pulse before I start and when I end, and it doesn't take very long to drop 10 beats per minute. And that's just a short time. Well, not everybody shares my desire to be outdoors. I understand that. But you too can find ways to explore creation. For example, I really love my house plants. I enjoy learning about each one and what they need and how to take care of them. And I believe that I benefit from having so much green around me, especially now and in a couple of months, right? I also really enjoy our bird feeders and the many friends who come to eat. In fact, I'm convinced that some of these birds just come to visit us. We have this hummingbird that will hover at the window to tell me, hey, your feeder is empty. <laughs> and it comes whenever Wren is practicing her cello. And we also have a cardinal that comes to listen to the cello. Isn't that wonderful? Once we begin to spend more time in creation, being still, and specifically cultivating wonder, we can properly lament. We lament the injustices of our actions against creation and against our neighbors. Like Eustace, we will relapse, but by wondering at creation, the cure has begun. Creation is so amazing. There are so many things to experience that will cause us to wonder. From the beautiful designs of creatures that allow them to exist in all kinds of environments, to the incredible relationships we see in creation, ranging from communicating trees to humming giraffes. I hope you will leave here tonight with a new or renewed interest in learning about all of the amazing intricacies of creation. In Job we read, but ask the animals and they will teach you. Won't you look for ways to read landscapes, real or fictional? Spending time in landscapes will help you cultivate wonder and rejoin the chorus of praise to our creator. Before we answer questions, I wanna thank a few of my friends. First, I want to thank Walter and Darlene Hansen for providing the Ken and Jean Hansen Lectureship. This experience has been a tremendous encouragement and an inspiration for my new areas of scholarship. Thank you to everyone at the Wade Center, especially Marge and Laura, who really helped me a lot as I had to navigate a brand new area of scholarship I appreciate Christina, Noah, and Emily who had amazing responses to my original lectures and gave me so much more to think about. Thank you to my editor, David McNutt, for your encouragement and for guiding me through the process and InterVarsity Press for publishing the book and for providing advanced copies to my students this <laughs> semester. I appreciate my family um, for everything, for driving so many miles on my behalf reading drafts, listening to my ideas, and joining me in my pursuit of wonder. Thank you to Jim Beitler and our students in Tolkien and Environmental Stewardship. I appreciate all of the ways you've helped me continue to think about all of these ideas. I wanna thank all of my friends and my colleagues and my students, past and present. Special shout out to my ecology class and my research students. Of course, Tolkien and Environment, you already got yours. <laughs> thank you for coming and listening and encouraging me along the way. Thank you, everybody, for being here and listening. Do you have any questions? Before we 
give you a chance to ask questions, I want to encourage you to come to the next Hansen Lectureship, which is about romanticism and our authors. And many people cite the romantic movement in the late 18th century, early 19th century as generating the interest in environmentalism. I mean, there's Wordsworth's famous sonnet, um, the world is too much with us late and soon getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours, we've given our hearts away, a sordid boon. He was saying that in 1812, and that is the way that Kristen, Dr. Page, began her um, talk tonight. So I saw Jeff Barbeau, stand up Jeff. He is gonna be giving a series of lectures starting January 26 on romanticism. And if you're interested in the environment, you're gonna want to come to know more about how romanticism influenced our authors. Before the question and answers, I want to introduce the um, editor that Kristen just thanked, um, Dr. David McNutt, where are you? <laughs> Hi, Kristen. Thank you very much. Uh, a captive audience, oh boy, <laughs> an editor's dream. Um, thank you, uh, I'm just coming from University Press uh, to bring a word of thanks to the Wade Center and a word of congratulations to Kristen for the publication of the Wonders of Creation. Um, it is our distinct uh, pleasure and my personal privilege to be able to work with all of the Wade authors, to be able to work with Marge and with Laura and the Hansons and everybody who's involved in producing these uh, marvelous uh, books. This is, as Crystal mentioned at the beginning, the sixth now volume in the series, which is filling up a bit of your bookshelf, hopefully. Started with a volume by Dr. Riken and Dr. Cologne, Dr. Larson, Dr. Root, Dr. Milliner, now Dr. Page. The next volume will be by Dr. Knoll on C.S. Lewis based on the lectures he gave uh, earlier this year and then Dr. Barbeau's volume to follow that. So, um, uh, Kristen, you, you've spoken eloquently and written eloquently about varieties of landscapes. I just want to thank you for contributing to another landscape, that of Christian publishing. So we are grateful for the partnership that we have with the Wade Center and the opportunity that we have uh, to bring uh, new light to these resources here at the Wade Center and to introduce uh, authors like you to a much broader audience. I'm so glad it's getting used in your class with Dr. Beitler, but uh, your classroom is much larger now uh, through the book. And I have to say, these, uh, you know, I've, I've worked on all of these volumes. I've loved all of them, all of them. Um, these photos, the color images that Dr. Page took are just fantastic. And, uh, Nobody else has photos like these in their Hanson Lecture volumes, I'll just tell you that. So, um, again, just a, a word of uh, thanks and appreciation. And uh, my only question for you is how many copies can I buy, and where can I get them, and how many can you sign for me? That'll happen after this. So thank you so much for everything, and we're looking forward to continuing this partnership with the Wade Center. So thank you all for coming. You will be able to go out in the, near the entrance area and go into the museum to buy your own copy of Kristen's book and uh, get her to sign it. For just you, this evening, there is a 20% discount on this book as well as all those other Hanson Lecture um, books that Dr. McNett just showed to you. Um, and with no further ado, Kristen, why don't you come up here and what we need you to do is, since we were planning to have a mic that we would pass around, <laughs> and we could still pass the mic, but it doesn't work, so <laughs> why do that? So if you have a question, Go ahead and raise your hand, and then um, Dr. Page will repeat the question to make sure everybody heard it. 
and um, <laughs> we'll proceed from there. So, are there any questions? I guess he doesn't have one. <laughs> I know he does. <laughs> Yes, why don't you stand up? Dr. Oh. Page, what was the first, <laughs> what was the very first uh, thought you had about nature and when did you discover you really loved nature? Did, was there any inspiration that someone <laughs> Well, Dr. Page, <laughs> in case you haven't figured that out, that's my dad. <laughs> and he asked me, who inspired me? Well, you know, my dad loved to camp. <laughs> Not at all. No, <laughs> no um, my grandmother and my mom spent a lot of time with me outdoors. And I think that um, between Nanny, um, my dad's mom, and... My mom, my mom was a big birder, is still a big birder, and my grandmother loved plants, and she loved to teach me about her garden and how to cook the things that she grew in her garden, and I think that that's where it began, just with, I think, to instill wonder, it's very good to start with children, and so to share with children your love of creation will um, instill in them a good way of starting to cultivate wonder and a care for creation. Dr. Page, where is God? Oh, so in my original lectures, I told the story of my dad interviewing me um, when I was two. <laughs> and it's a lot funnier if you actually hear my Southern accent, but I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> um, so my dad asked me. <laughs> in the back of the room. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yes, if you had a chance to restart or continue the work you've done in the lecture and book series, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about your experience? That's a great question. So she asked if there was anything that I would do differently or add um, if I were to start again or continue on. And I have been thinking about that a lot, actually. Um, I've been thinking a lot about wonder and privilege as I prepared for tonight. And I wonder if wonder is a construct of privilege. And how can we ensure that everyone, regardless of what they have access to, can cultivate wonder? And I think that that's something that I want to continue to pursue. I want to make sure that everybody, regardless of where they live, um, would be able to recognize something wonderful if they saw it, and then also be able to see things that are wonderful. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Was Stand your, up, please. Was this your first foray into the works of Tolkien and Lewis, or do you have a story of, of coming to them earlier? Well, of course I read them when I was younger, but um, this really is the first time I spent a good about a time with them. So I feel like, I feel like after the process, now I'm where I probably should have been when I started, and I have so much more to learn, um, but um, beyond just reading um, Tolkien and Lewis for English classes, I didn't have a lot of experience. Um, how would you answer Karen Armstrong? She has a new book out on the theology of nature, and she says that Eastern pantheism is much more eco-friendly than Western theism. She says in pantheism, you have a direct relation with the natural world and you're part of it, whereas Western theology tends to, you have a relationship to God, but nature's sort of peripheral, or I wouldn't say disposable, but it's not intrinsically a part of your, 
your spiritual relationship? That's the, the point she makes in this book. How would you respond to that as a Christian? Well, I think that we just have to, um, the question, did it, for those in the back, the question was, um, how do I respond to the idea that um, Eastern religions are, are more friendly to um, ecological thought than um, Christianity? Is that a decent um, restatement? Um, well, I mean, it is easier if you, if you um, look at Eastern religions, I guess, on the surface, it's kind of easier because they believe so differently than we do about um, God and about our role on the earth. I think that what's hard as a Christian to um, express is we are created. We are created with a special purpose, uh, but we're still created. And I think that sometimes we get the message um, very strongly that that special purpose we don't have to think about the created part. And, um, and so I think it's just a, a, a means of reframing how we speak among Christians. And it's not dangerous to, to recognize that we are created. God came to earth and lived incarnate. He lived as a person. And he experienced what we experience. And so it's not bad to say that we're created. And that we were created, part of our role as being created creatures is to care for what's created. And so I love to remind people of um, what Dr. McGowan helped me remember, um, that the language in Genesis around creation is temple language. So we're to care for the place where God dwells. And we're created beings in relationship with God in his creation called to care for the place where he dwells. What an awesome privilege. And I think when it's worded that way, people can understand it. But people are fearful when we word it in ways that fringe on that Eastern spirituality. So I understand that fearfulness, and I understand why that author would have said what they said, but I don't necessarily agree that Christianity has to keep... We, we can embrace our createdness, and we can do that in the construct of what God has called us to do as his created people, working to be in relation with him in this creation that he made. Yes? <laughs> Should I find out? Sure. Okay. Um, which one's your favorite photo? Which one was my favorite photo? All of them. <laughs> the one I'm taking at the moment. Um, maybe, maybe the very first one, though, the bluebird, because that's special because it's my mom's bluebird. And she, she sings to them and calls them in, and they come and take worms, and they beg. They know her, and they know us. And so I can get pretty close to them because they trust us. So maybe that one. I mean, I love all the ones of my daughter, Wren. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Have, have you done for like the landscapes of the Bible what you did for the landscapes of Narnia and I, Middle Earth? I do that when I'm reading the Bible. I haven't written them down, but I do that when I'm reading. I can't repeat the question. I'm sorry. Have I have I um, have I done for the landscapes in the Bible? what I did with the landscapes of Narnia and Middle Earth. Um, I do that when I'm reading the Bible. Certainly, I can't, I struggle to read the Bible and not read it as an ecologist. Um, and that's not appropriate. I understand that. Um, <laughs> a lot of the times it might not be. Um, so, but they're not fictional. And I think that um, for me, it's a little bit different because I see them as real places, and I know the ecology of those real places, so it feels a little bit different, but I like that idea, and I think maybe I should try to write some of those down. Mm. That's a good idea. It just strikes me how many of the major events happen outdoors. Right. Yes, I do. It strikes him that... How many of the major events happened outdoors, he said. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, you know, Jesus really understood ecology, I mean, I love his parables because the parables really show you just how much he understood the world and the way that it worked. And some of the parables that 
I struggle the most with, you know, like, um, are where he, I know he understands what's going on, but he's pointing out something that's happening that shouldn't be happening ecologically. And so for me, I, I learn a lesson that way. I don't, might not be for everybody. I think we all learn lessons in different ways, but yes. Yes. I was wondering if you had a favorite Bible verse about nature, and then also if you had a favorite fictional landscape from Narnia. Do I have a favorite Bible verse um, about nature and a favorite fictional landscape from Narnia? Um, I love the passage in Job, but ask the animals to teach you and the birds of the air to tell you. Um, I love that verse because I feel like I love Job. It's just very, um, that is a landscape that I read a lot and I think a lot about because I teach in mountains a lot. And so when I'm teaching there, I'm thinking about um, what I don't know, um, as Job, as we read in Job. Uh, my favorite landscape, other than the land between worlds, um, I really like the horse and his boy when they're, when they're traveling. I like that sequence of landscapes a lot. And I also, um, I really like in the Don Treader, how the, each island is a different ecosystem. I like that a lot too. So I, it would be really hard for me to pick. I, I love them all. <coughs> Last question. I really appreciate your emphasis on wonder. Uh, my work has been in the spiritual formation of children and some of the criteria that researchers have found are essential are a sense of awe and wonder which makes the spiritual life of a child come to life. So with your emphasis on um, privilege and this kind of thing, and all your travels with hunger, have you found a difference in awe and wonder in children connecting with the spiritual life in underserved areas in comparison to the children that may happen to be in privileged areas? Something I've just been wondering about as I've heard you talk tonight. So have I seen a difference in privilege versus not privileged areas and wonder as a sense of awe and wonder of the of, other in of children populations. it's definitely different um i don't know that i can say it's this way in privileged places and this and a different way in underprivileged places it really depends on the place one thing that i've noticed as i've traveled with hunger and it's true for children and adults that places where I'm like, oh my goodness, this is the most beautiful place I've ever been. People are surprised when I say that because they live there mm -hmm. and it's what they know and they don't necessarily see it the same way that I'm seeing it. And so that's true for children and adults. I think that children, it's the way we're created to experience wonder. It's easier to cultivate wonder in a child than an adult, for sure, no matter where you are whether you're privileged or not privileged. I don't know that it's diff I don't, Scotty, I don't know that I've seen it different in those two contexts. I think children are different than adults. So we tend to lose our sense of wonder. We really have to work hard as adults to, to experience wonder, I think. Um, but I think God put that in us as children. Um, and I think that's why when we, um, when we teach children through wonder, when we te especially their spiritual, direct spiritual formation, I wonder what you thought. What are you wondering? That's on purpose because children can wonder and they can think more broadly and make connections that we wouldn't make. And it is wonderful. Okay, one more. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I'm a great fan of beauty and nature, but there's also the other side in Narnia and Middle Earth and the Bible, um, and I, I think about all those hundreds of thousands of people who were killed in the Old Testament, especially, and that meant that there was a lot of ugliness that happened to nature as it happened in Narnia. How do you deal with that? So how do you deal with all of the ugliness 
in nature and all of the death um, in nature. Well, I think that's where lament comes in, isn't it? I think that part of what I was trying to talk about tonight was the death that comes because of this broken relationship that we are living in. And as a result, we suffer and creation suffers. And um, all we can do, I mean, I can't reconcile, necess- you know, I can't, I can't explain why all those deaths had to happen, but I can lament them. And I can use the lament to propel me to action so I can change the way that I'm living so that I might be able to pave a different path for people in the future. I don't know if that really answers your, your question, but that's, I think, the best I can do. <laughs> Let's thank Dr. Page once again.